thank you very much, Marianne. And thank you again so much, Ambassador, for joining us. Um, you know, as Marianne noted, um, you know, we're going to discuss China tonight, um, but also I think in light of the, the horrific news out of Kabul today, uh, for them, you, you might have seen the news yet, uh, terrorist bombings, presumably by, I think they took responsibility, ISIS-K uh, killed at least 12 uh, uh, American soldiers and over 60 Afghans. Uh, as Marianne noted in your, your bio, I, I, I think there are probably very few people who have such a credible degree of experience, both in China, uh, your multiple postings, your last one is the uh, you know, deputy chief, uh, basically the acting uh, ambassador for the United States in China, but also incredible experiences on the ground and in Washington, D.C. related to Afghanistan. Um, about two weeks before the fall of Kabul, a lot of people might remember uh, some photos making the headlines. It was the Chinese foreign minister at a meeting in China, uh, along with the, one of the uh, Taliban's political leaders. And the Chinese uh, at the time said, we extend an offer of friendly cooperation to Afghanistan. Um, obviously, people for decades have talked about the billions of dollars worth of minerals in Afghanistan that the Chinese would love to access to, and anybody would like to have access to. What do you think are the realistic outlooks for China's presence in Afghanistan? And they, are they perhaps maybe more hesitant uh, to get involved uh, in Afghanistan than maybe a lot of people realize just with the incredible instability and just horrific rates of violence? Roman, thank you very much. And Marianne, thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's good, I guess, uh, what's the verb tense or the, uh, it's good to be back uh, with, uh, in Houston, even though I'm, I'm here at home. Uh, I was so impressed with your group the last time I was there. Uh, it really is an honor to be back again. And Ronan, thank you for bringing up what happened in Afghanistan today. I, I, uh, you're right, I spent most of my career working on China, but I, I did a detour of almost five years working on, on Afghan policy. And when I served at our embassy uh, in Kabul, uh, we would begin every week with what we call a country team meeting, essentially the, the, the uh, ambassador's senior staff uh, sort of talking through uh, the events of the week. But we would start every one of those with a reading of the names of the American service personnel who had died uh, over the previous week. And it was a sobering moment. You know, most weeks it would be a dozen uh, or 15 people. You know, on a bad week, it would be 20 or 30. And it was really difficult uh, uh, as uh, to, to understand what we had asked our, uh, you know, people who were my, my, my son's age or my daughter's age at the time uh, uh, to do. Uh, and it, 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 is, uh, it is remarkable sacrifices that, uh, that uh, they uh, gave and continue to give uh, up until today, sadly. Uh, you know, I, if you're sitting in Beijing, uh, I, they're, they're, you know, they've, they've seen the news stories about the trillion dollars worth of, uh, of uh, minerals under the, the soil of Afghanistan, but I'm sure they're nervous, and I think they're rightly nervous. You know, they, they watched what happened to the United States, uh, not, not entirely watched. I mean, they, they, uh, the Chinese obviously are close partners with Pakistan, Pakistan. Uh, they called the, the head of the Taliban the Quetta Shura, Quetta, a city in, uh, in northwest Pakistan for a reason, because it was based out of that city. Uh, and so China has been deeply uh, involved in what's been going on in Afghanistan for a long time. Uh, but it's not just that. They were involved in the, uh, the U.S.-led effort to arm the Mujahideen uh, that led to the downfall of the Soviet Union, but also that led to the rise of al-Qaeda, right? That the, the, the uh, Freedom fighters, the holy warriors, uh, were uh, you know, spawned uh, the breed of, of extremism that led to Osama bin Laden. Uh, but also, they know the British history and the history of every empire that has uh, uh, set foot in Afghanistan. They call it, I think, for good reason, the graveyard of empires. Uh, and so, I don't think the the uh, F uh, Chinese who have spent a lot of time looking at at the issues there. Uh, uh, are looking with great glee at what's happened over the last week or so, but they understand the challenges and they understand that uh, you know, whatever the national security threat Afghanistan posed and poses to the United States, uh, it, it doesn't border China. It doesn't. It doesn't border the United States. China and, and Afghanistan share a border, and they know that there's a there's a real risk that the you know that 
that uh, uh, in general, uh, countries uh, uh, engaging with Afghanistan is a money losing proposition, not, a, not an opportunity to, to uh, strike it really. And, and just to you know, put it in context, we've done various programs related to the plight of Uyghurs and, and other minorities in China, uh, you know, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province and you know, the, the far western parts of China, uh, a lot of the, the Muslim minority groups. There has been a degree of terrorism in the past, but, but obviously most people say it's not um, justification for sending a million plus people through re-education camps. How concerned do you think the Chinese are that say, if Afghanistan is once again not just controlled by the Taliban, but say with their tacit agreements or allegiance with Al Qaeda and then ISIS K, um, trying to have their you know make their own stand and where their own presence felt that that could bleed over into you know their own Muslim population. So well, I think the Chinese feel like if they were, that they could deal with the Taliban, you know, that the, the, uh, the issues that make the Taliban really unacceptable to the United States are much less of a concern to the, to the Chinese. Treatment of women, human rights concerns, I mean, those have never been a, a major focus of, of Chinese foreign policy. Uh, I think their bigger concern is, and, and is what happened at the airport in, in Kabul uh, uh, today, which is for all appearances, the Taliban didn't want that to happen. You know, that this was ISIS-K, the, the uh, offshoot of what sprung up in Iraq, uh, uh, and metastasized to South, South Asia, you know, that was uh, uh, sort of one of the stew of extremists that, that now live in these really ungoverned spaces. And what China worries about is not a, an Afghanistan controlled by the Taliban, but an Afghanistan controlled by no one. And that's almost the, the natural state of that part of the world uh, uh, you know, without outside without outside support. And you know, the United States has now made it clear uh, that we are not going to continue to be that source of outside uh, of stability. And it's kind of maybe moving now more onto the kind of the broader topic of this evening, the idea of, of the US and United States and who will kind of, you know, hopefully, you know, set the, the standard of, of leading the world in, in the years to come. Um, I am not trying to make any direct correlations between the Taliban and the Chinese. They obviously are extremely different in many ways, but they both uh, have governments that can be very intolerant. They can be very repressive forms of governments. Uh, as, you, as you noted, uh, human rights issues are not a grave concern to either government. Are you concerned um, that over the years, China has had enormous economic influence all around the world, investing tens of billions of dollars all over the world, every continent, um, but it may be even more so that the Chinese political model of, of growing autocracy, of a strong state, that it can be seen as, as a viable model, whether it be in somewhere like Venezuela or in Turkey or Hungary, um, that that may be longer term for the United States and kind of what we hold as kind of, you know, the liberal world order, um, the kind of free world order, that that's maybe a bigger threat than the economic influence of China? So I don't think you can disaggregate them. I mean, it's, it is the, $64,000 renminbi question, right? Is, is you know, how attractive and how uh, uh, replicable is the Chinese model? A model that's based on really uh, intensive uh, involvement by the state, but also competence by the state. Uh, and uh, uh, and I, there is clearly a political attraction uh, to autocratic governments around the world to the Chinese model. I would say there is much less of an attraction to that, uh, to that, uh, to that political model among uh, people around the world, uh, except for to the extent that the Chinese model has been able to deliver the goods economically, right? That, that you know, if you are in a, a low income country, uh, that the Chinese model looks pretty good. Now, my personal sense is, you know, you know, a, a sort of a close examination of the history, trying to spend a long time uh, uh, driving the car into a ditch for, you know, 30 years, essentially the 30 years after the revolution uh, until uh, 1978, uh, really running the economy down. And so they've been building over the last 40 years and really impressive 40 years uh, from a, an artificially low baseline that, uh, you know, the, the counterfactual that we can't answer is, you know, what if they China had adopted sensible economic policies in 1949. Where would 
where would it be today uh, versus uh, uh, where we are now? Uh, but the other thing is, as you know, if you invest your money anywhere, they will tell you that past performance is no guarantee of future results. That uh, you know, just like the United States has to, you know, for our model to both economic and political to remain attractive, we have to continue to deliver. The Chinese economic model is going to have to continue to deliver. And uh, that looked a lot better a couple of years ago than it does today. Uh, and so, you know, the, there, there are real challenges uh, on both sides. So, you know, I, I, I think last time when I was there, I, I noted to you that I'm a Chicago Cubs fan. And so by <laughs> temperament, I am an optimist. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, I think we have a pretty good system. We have to recognize the strength of our system and we have to uh, play to those strengths. You know, that's the, the challenge that, that the United States faces. And, and you, uh, you know, touched upon it. Uh, obviously, there would have been different peoples all across the world, different countries who, who might have questioned kind of the Western or the kind of, you know, you know kind of the, the American economic model. Uh, I think perhaps especially after 2008, you know, global recession that many saw as it started here in the United States, it was, you know, maybe a little too much you know, freewheeling capitalism without enough regulation. You know, people would say, oh, well, maybe it wouldn't have happened with the Chinese model. But um, do we perhaps maybe also for the enormous economic growth that you mentioned, not give enough credit or give undue credit to the, the, to the Communist Party and their great job with the economy in many ways, but a lot of ways just to the regular uh, private sector and the individual, you know, businessmen and women in China who, who really maybe cause so much of this growth. No, I think you, you've hit the nail on the head, Ronan, that, that uh, uh, in a way it's the rooster who, uh, who crows and, you know, and thinks the sun comes up because he, he uh, crows in the morning. Uh, you know, the, the Communist Party has done some impressive things, uh, but mainly it's been the, the, the most impressive results have come by stepping out of the way of the private sector. Uh, and and uh, I think, I mean, I get the sense and uh, I guess I will make bold predictions because probably no one will watch this in a few years to, uh, 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 to check, check on this, but I get the sense that the economic plan is from, led from the very, very top, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, have not uh, internalized that message because uh, if you watch what's going on in the stock market, if you watch what's going on with consumer and, and business confidence in China in the last just couple of months, uh, you get the sense that uh, the party uh, believes that it's got this figured out and that what China really needs is a good injection of, of uh, state management. And you know there are areas, I think you, you accurately point out that the 2008 financial crisis was probably in part led by a, a failure of state uh, government uh, oversight, uh, but uh, you can clearly overcorrect in the other direction. And my my, I I suspect that's what's going on right now. And 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 turning to the the U.S. role and influence on on China, um, I think obviously number one, you have to give China all the credit that's due for the incredible turnaround they've done in the last forty years. But I think. You would probably agree more than anybody. Number two, the nation most responsible for that is the United States, whether it's you know Clinton working to get them the WTO or just our enormous market or American businesses going over there and establishing manufacturing or teach you um, you know people you know ways of doing business. Um, just you know, it's been a, a complicated issue for every American president for, for you know I'd say since you know Bush and Clinton and Bush again and Obama. Uh, but looking at at, at Trump and Obama, I don't want to oversimplify things, but maybe just if people were to take something from the headlines, you think it's a fair assessment to say that Trump was uh, perhaps primarily focused upon trade issues and that uh, Biden now is perhaps maybe more focused with regards to China upon reassuring allies and alliances in the region and, and also addressing human rights concerns. So I think, uh, I think the first part is, is clearly true. Trump was was very much focused on trade and and probably even more specifically on trade in goods, right? That 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 Donald Trump and and his advisors, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, saw the world through a a import and export of things perspective. Uh, 
I think, you know, I'm not part of the Biden campaign, but I know a lot of the people who are in there and I know a lot of people who uh, uh, continue to work for the government in the, in the civil service. Uh, the, you know, the Biden, I'm not a spokesman for the Biden administration, but I think they'd say, look, our focus on allies and partners uh, is a focus with a purpose. Uh, in other words, we're shoring up those partnerships because we need to present a unified uh, front uh, on issues like human rights, on issues like uh, uh, state support for uh, national champions, in other words, Chinese support for uh, state-owned enterprises, the non-competitive aspects, uh, you know, just impossible to compete against a, a, uh, a company that has the deep pockets of a, of a country the size of China behind it. So they would say that, you know, our focus on allies and partners is one grounded in, in values and interests, but also focused on the, the practical uh, applications of, that, that those partnerships can bring. And, and then with regards to human rights, um, do you think that has been more of a priority under Biden? Um, or do you think, sadly, regardless of who's president, uh, at the end of the day, the Chinese are not going to change their human rights uh, postures, especially within the country, if they think it's in their best interest? And you know, maybe a, a US president chastising on human rights just plays into their, their narrative to the Chinese populace as just Americans trying to interfere. I mean, what's your thought? Yeah, I think you're both, both of those uh, are right, right? That, that the Biden administration is more concerned about human rights uh, and that the Chinese uh, uh, are, are inclined to tell the president to pound sand. And, and you know, my experience, I, I started going to China as a diplomat in 1990, the year after Tiananmen. Uh, uh, and uh, it, over that time between 1990, when I started going as a US official and when I left in 2017, you know, that was the period of that really rapid growth of uh, Chinese economic power and that came with it uh, political power. Uh, and you could see the, the shrinking of US leverage on, on a lot of issues, but particularly on human rights over that time. And uh, I mean, honestly, human rights were really just a question of leverage. And in 1990, uh, we had the leverage to go to the Chinese and, and say things like, here's a list of dissidents that uh, uh, we would like you to release to improve the atmosphere of the relationship so we can cooperate in, in other areas, so we can uh, move past these issues and, uh, and as you want to do, uh, uh, look for ways to bring China into the, the global community. By 2017, essentially that leverage was gone and the Chinese were, were simply not interested uh, in listening. Uh, and I think that's what, what the Biden administration uh, faces now. Now, at the same time, I think it's important to talk about, frankly, about what uh, divides us. You know, that we have to be honest with the Chinese about the difference in our values, our interests. Uh, uh, and it's important, even if we don't have the leverage to make things happen, to make those points. But I think it's also important uh, to get back to your previous question, because uh, how we talk about values uh, and, frankly, how we behave uh, it, uh, will influence our ability to get the rest of the world, our traditional allies and partners, uh, to rally behind us. And, and mentioning uh, the importance of allies, um, you know, since uh, World War II and then, you know, the, the end of the, or I suppose the, the, I suppose this armistice for the Korean War, not exactly an end, uh, we've had tens of thousands of American soldiers stationed in both China, sorry, Thai, uh, South Korea, the Republic of Korea, uh, and Japan. Um, obviously, there's not a, a joint agreement like with NATO, where it's a collective, uh, the collective defense of all those countries, but we have joint you know, defense treaties with those Korea and Japan that we would uh, defend them uh, from an outside you know, third party attack. You know, obviously, China comes to the top of the list there. How important has it been the work that Biden's done to kind of reassure that alliance? And uh, when we chatted before, you also talked about the fact that he's trying to relieve the tensions between the Japanese and the South Koreans themselves. Yeah, I, I mean, that was, I, again, as someone who spent a career mostly on Asia, one of the things that worried me most about the Trump presidency was, was the drift uh, between Tokyo or uh, the, the 
how far apart Tokyo and Seoul had drifted. That by the end of the Trump administration, I mean, there was real hostility uh, uh, between those two countries. And, you know, it's not surprising at one level because, you know, Japan and Korea have a very troubled history. There's a, it, it's, and, and uh, 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 I don't think it's plausible to put that behind, you know, for those countries, even uh, uh, despite having a lot of common interests. I, I think it's just history they're gonna to have to deal with. But one of the, the really useful functions uh, the United States has played in that relationship has been the ability to, when things start getting hot, uh, to quietly sit down with our partners, our allies, uh, and, uh, uh, and talk through and work out ways uh, to avoid having those inevitable tensions flare up into a rupture in the relationship. Because that doesn't serve US interests it doesn't serve Japanese interests, doesn't serve South Korean interests. And yeah, you know, obviously related to that, uh, Taiwan, we have no such security agreements or treaties with, and, and I'm presumably we will not have. Um, what do you think is the kind of, I suppose, realistic chances, say in the next five to 10 years, that China might actually invade uh, Taiwan, or perhaps they would maybe just continue a soft, gradual takeover by further gaining influence in the economy, further influence in uh, Chinese friendly political parties, in the media. Uh, but if, if Taiwan was actually attacked, what do you think U.S. response would be? So, I, first of all, I got to say that, that uh, Taiwan uh, has been one of the real, and, and sort of, even though it's thorny and difficult, has been a real success of American diplomacy. The fact that you have this island of 30 million people, a democracy, a really vibrant uh, uh, civil society, a, a hugely successful economy is due to the fact that for 50 years, the United States has figured out you know, how to make this uneasy status quo work. Uh, I, I personally am relatively, I, you know, I, the Chinese are a lot of things, as I was saying before, but they're not stupid. They understand the military uh, challenge that uh, an invasion of Taiwan would pose, even if the United States doesn't come to Taiwan's uh, aid. Uh, just because Taiwan's a relatively small place, it's got sophisticated weaponry, and you know, the last successful. Uh, 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 do you call it uh, uh, amphibious, amphibious assault? <laughs> amphibious amphibious assault, guess, assault was, I think, what you talked about, 1950 or 1951, and the, and yeah. the uh, Inchon landing. That you know, it's really difficult to do. And China, uh, you know, failure. Uh, the only thing worse than than uh, succeeding at uh, uh, retaking Ta or taking Taiwan, because it's never been part of the People's Republic of China, uh, because that would have enormous political and economic co consequences for. For uh, the PRC would be failing to take it. You know that could bring the government down. That the, the nationalist reaction, which Beijing has been really careful to stoke, uh, would I think be uh, impossible or very very difficult to restrain. And just looking at the, the region more broadly, um, I think it's a term or, or a phrase that a lot of Americans may not have been familiar with until you know relatively recently. But this idea of the Quad. Uh, the United States, Japan, Australia, and India, uh, four you know notable democracies, you know, first world countries, but all with you know quite capable militaries in different different ways. Um, can you talk about the importance of that alliance? And do you think it's getting stronger, or maybe more efficient? And um, related to that, if Taiwan was not a military threat, are you more concerned about a miscalculation or a military confrontation, say in the South China Sea or, or East China Sea? Well, uh, I'm going to correct you, Ronan, because it's important. You called uh, the Quad an alliance, and it very pointedly isn't. And okay, because Japan sure. isn't, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, not Japan, India. India is not the allying sort. I mean, that's just not mm -hmm. their, their uh, foreign policy DNA uh, makes them resistant to the kinds of relationships that the United States is used to, the NATO, Japan, Australia. Uh, but I think actually in the case of the Quad and in the case of the region, that's probably a good thing because what it, uh, it allows us to do is you have uh, a multi-speed uh, structure that you can have the kind of relationship that the United States and India have, which is fairly cordial, 
uh, but but it can only get so close because of India's uh, reluctance to uh, to, to uh, formal alliances. But then you have the very tight U.S. Australia, the very tight U.S. Japan uh, uh, relationships, and what binds us together is not the sort of the, the paper that we use to to formalize those things, uh, but the underlying concerns that we have. And I think the uh, the administration appropriately talks about them in positive senses. And it's not just this administration; previous administrations have done the same. Which is, uh, our goals are not to contain China. It's not about about uh, pushing back on Chinese hegemony. It's defining uh, the, uh, 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 the stakes on our terms, which is a very positive message of, we want a free and open Indo-Pacific. You know, we want countries, uh, whether they're large or small, to be able to determine their own destiny, control their own territory. So uh, it's, it's uh, a message that I think appeals to a lot of uh, countries in the region, particularly smaller countries, that aren't interested in getting stuck in a, in a military conflict between the United States and China. Uh, on that note, your final uh, sort of uh, point. Yeah, I worry a lot about, I happen to be uh, at our embassy in Beijing uh, in 2001, in April of 2001, when a Chinese plane uh, knocked, uh, flew into and knocked out of the air an American surveillance plane flying over the South China Sea. Again, I, I get back to my point on leverage the leverage that the PRC had in 2001, even though I mean, from a military perspective was clearly the Chinese pilot's fault. Uh, no one in China uh, accepted that or believed that. They saw this as an American provocation. Uh, and uh, you know what was a very uh, tense diplomatic standoff 20 years ago, I could easily see uh, leading to conflict now. And the only thing that's changed is just that the US and China are now operating much more actively uh, in the region. So that just increases the chances of that kind of accidental encounter. And I, mean, I suppose just to note, when you were involved in uh, trying to de-escalate those, those rising tensions, uh, you know, 20 years ago, China's military was not just, you know, much smaller, but much less modern, much less advanced, you know, and also, you know, fortunately, uh, neither, uh, no, no, you know, uh, no one on, on the Chinese or American side, either of those pilots were killed. Yeah, I mean, if something yeah. did happen like that again, uh, are you concerned that it could flare up into some, uh, you know, actual shooting? Well, to be clear, the, the Chinese pilot died in there. The Chinese pilot. Oh, he did. Okay, died. sorry. Uh, okay. The American uh, pilot. He the was American captured. Pilots, right? the, okay. The plane was disabled, landed on a Chinese airfield because it couldn't get any farther. Uh, and it, I mean, there is a long. Uh, there was a long negotiation to get our our crew released. Uh, that led to a, you know, the president or the, the ambassador writing a letter uh, and you know, it involved verb tenses and translations of the word. Uh, was it regret or apologize? Uh, and and uh, you know, the stuff that diplomats love to sink their teeth in because it gives both sides a little room to back down. And uh, you know, another area I think of concern really for the last many, many decades, the United States has been at the forefront of advanced technologies, you know, a global innovator on everything to do with, you know, uh, you know, digital systems to medicine to um, a wide variety of topics and issues. Um, how concerned are you that the United States might fall behind, um, you know, some related to say, you know, cyber, you know, corporate espionage or, you know, Chinese tactics to get, uh, you know, American capabilities um, but also maybe just the United States itself doesn't continue to be a leader in STEM and developing, you know, scientists and, and uh, engineers and all of that. Yeah. Yeah, I worry about it. I think we, we should all worry about it. I mean, the, the, the U.S., one of our huge advantages has been over the last 30, 40 years has been that we have just been an engine of innovation, of good ideas, and of moving those good ideas from uh, the laboratory to the marketplace. Uh, and you know, China has they took note of that, and they are trying to emulate us. And you know, the the flattery or uh, uh, you know the uh, flattery is the best imitation, or, imitation is the best form of flattery. I guess. Form of flattery, yeah. yeah. And and they clearly are are flattering us. Uh, I have never been one to complain to the referees. You know, to complain about you know. 
yes, we should push back on, on Chinese intellectual property theft. Uh, yes, we should do everything we can to protect uh, intellectual property uh, uh, of American companies. Uh, but at the same time, the country that we have the most influence over uh, is the United States, and we've got to up our game. You know, we have to refocus on uh, the kinds of programs that led to uh, the breakthroughs that, that pushed students to go into sciences uh, and technology. Uh, we have to uh, uh, make sure that we continue to be a magnet for the best talent around the world, not just a magnet, but that, that the best talent from around the world is able to get here uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and pursue the kinds of research that will keep us uh, at the forefront of technology. And I suppose we spent you know, most of the time talking about possible areas of competition um, and you know, hopefully not you know, confrontation. Uh, but to look at areas where perhaps we, we could cooperate or we should at least cooperate with, with China. Um, you know, some of the, the big ones that come up, you think about environmental issues, global health. Um, what do you think is realistic with regards to environmental cooperation? Um, you know, in terms of CO2 output, China is still attempting enormous economic growth. They have to produce a certain amount of electricity. They're building you know, they'll build solar farms, wind farms, nuclear plants, but they'll also build a huge number of coal plants. Well, what's realistic in terms of uh, environmental cooperation? So it, it is, it's one of the very few areas where I'm modestly optimistic, uh, although it's really hard to, uh, to go from the, U, the, the assessment, and I, I, I think it's true, that both the United States, certainly the Biden administration, and, and China, that uh, uh, understand the threat posed by climate change. But then to translate that into how do we concretely cooperate uh, is, going to be, is going to be difficult. But you, know, you take your wins where you can get them right now in the US-China relationship. And just uh, having a, a couple of areas where we at least can talk the same language and we're not at loggerheads uh, uh, is, is, uh, is kind of encouraging. So. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm modestly optimistic on that. On so many other areas, you know, you talked about global public health. Uh, you look at the handling of the, the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, and I think the understandable, but ultimately, I think everyone knew it would be futile effort to investigate the origins without Chinese cooperation. Uh, I, you know, the, the, I think that will... Uh, yeah, that will have repercussions. You know, I'm not blaming the Biden administration or the Trump administration for trying to figure out wh how, what caused the, uh, the COVID outbreak, uh, but it's gonna have repercussions for our ability to cooperate on, on global public health, which is another area where we uh, clearly have an interest in, in making sure that we don't see another one of these. And, and just related to that, you know, the, the outbreak of, of, of COVID-19 in Wuhan, uh, uh, you know, it, a lot of American audiences don't see it, but there was kind of almost similar to the Russian tactics of throw enough disinformation out there, something will stick. Uh, Chinese media have thrown out, you know, propaganda that it was brought in or started by American defense services, it was brought in the United States. Um, if that's the level of, of, of the discourse, uh, how, do you think there's any chance ever we get to the real cause of the outbreak? Uh, and perhaps can maybe really cooperate in the years to come for hopefully, you know, the next pandemic. I don't want to talk about it, but, you know, there's probably another one coming at some point soon. You know, Ron, we have kind of the same thing here right now, right? With, with uh, uh, between the two sides of the spectrum in the American political system, uh, where, for example, on the last election, there are very different views on what happened in, in the last election. Uh, but there are areas where Democrats and Republicans can cooperate, right? Uh, have can figure things out. Now, I would hate to think that our model is uh, will be uh, domestically will be the model for how the United States and China cooperate. But but ultimately, uh, I, you know, we're going to have to find identify those areas where we have to get along. And, you know, ultimately, I'm an optimistic part because it's not like we can go anywhere, right? We have we will share this planet whether we like the 1.4 billion Chinese or not, uh, and vice versa, uh, you know, that uh, whatever China's plans are, they're going to have to deal with the 350 million Americans uh, uh, who constitute the world's 
largest economy and will, for the foreseeable future, be a dominant economic and uh, uh, technological power. Uh, and so, you know, uh, that sort of calculation is going to, and you know, the fact that we're both nuclear armed, and so the the traditional recourse in those sorts of situations where you would slug it out uh, is taken off the table. I think uh, uh, means we're going to have to figure this out. And I suppose related to, to nuclear concerns, obviously we, we both have uh, different positions, but probably ultimately the same objective. Uh, related to, to North Korea, the Chinese don't want regime change. They don't want collapse. They don't want a few million North Korean refugees streaming across their border. And they really, they hate having uh, 10, 000, a few tens of thousands of American troops in South Korea. And they really don't want a new regime with thousands of more American troops in, in a maybe future North Korea. Um, but they're also not delighted by the Kim regime. Um, if you kind of take the starting point that if, you know, Kim sees maintaining nuclear weapons being existential to his regime, you know, Gaddafi gave them up, he died in a ditch. Saddam had chemical biological weapons, but he didn't have nuclear weapons, he was still invaded. Um, do you think there's good chances for working for intense hardcore containment so that at least the nuclear North Koreans are less likely to be able to um, release nuclear capabilities or technologies to terrorist groups or other rogue states? Do you have any degree of optimism for uh, jointly uh, addressing North Korea? Uh, I don't. Yeah, I got to be honest, Ron. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, in fact, a lot of what you've talked about has already come to pass, right? That that North Korea, uh, North Korean uh, scientists have had contacts with with uh, uh, scientists from states we consider rogue states. That you know, China doesn't happen to consider rogue states, though, right? That uh, mm -hmm. that a lot of that uh, uh, proliferation has already taken place. I think my uh, uh, I I have a very difficult time predicting where a place like North Korea is going to be in a decade. You know, China's opaque. China's hard to uh, you know it's, it, it's hard to understand how its politics works. Uh, but they, they, they do function in, in a uh, relatively predictable way, ultimately. And you can, you can uh, say with pretty good confidence that the People's Republic of China will be there in an another decade, even if Xi Jinping might have uh, left the stage for one reason or another. Uh, but, uh, but I get the sense of North Korea is much more brittle and it's the kind of place that would not surprise me uh, were there to be a dramatic political shift very quickly. I don't think it'd necessarily get better if you, uh, certainly not in the short term. You know, if you look at all of the places where the US had great hopes when authoritarian uh, regimes fell, that they would be replaced by places that were more reflective of, of popular will. Uh, and that hasn't been the trend, right? For the most part, uh, what follows strongman rule is, uh, is a, a deterioration toward chaos rather than uh, a, a sort of a expression of the popular will. All right, I'm just going to turn to the audience questions. Uh, Linda asks a you know, good question, and I'm sure especially the last year or two, maybe it's a lot of people's minds. Um, does Hong Kong have a future as a liberal uh, self-governing territory outside of Beijing's control? Is this the speed round? I, I wish I could be sort of more uh, more encouraging. Look, there are some aspects of the Hong Kong system that Beijing has an interest in making sure are maintained. So, uh, you know, one of the things that allows Hong Kong to remain an important financial center, and you know, the fact that you've got a convertible Hong Kong dollar means it's a very useful tool for Beijing, given the fact that the renminbi is not convertible. Uh, and so, you know, to maintain that uh, the city is a financial center, you've got to maintain the at least elements of uh, the rule of law. So, you know, if you're a business, uh, you have some confidence uh, that uh, the transactions you engage in uh, will be protected. And so, you know, I, I think those sorts of things uh, will, uh, uh, Beijing and the Hong Kong authorities will, will try to maintain, but it's going to be difficult, right? And we're already seeing that as the national security law, uh, you know, the implications of that law 
uh, sort of spread out. And you know, if this person said something five, four or five years ago on a certain uh, 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 you know uh, internet platform, who's liable for that? You know, how do you deal with those? And and that's the sort of uncertainty that I think business is just going to say enough. You know, I know how to deal with with uh, how to work on the mainland. I'll just go to Shanghai, uh, where where I don't have to worry about the rule of law. It's the you know the gray areas that we've learned how to operate with uh, under for the last 40, 50 years, uh, and and Hong Kong uh, you know will will lose its importance both economically and its uh, liberties politically. I. Uh, all right. Uh, another question, uh, somewhat related to what you, you touched on, you know, earlier of our own kind of uh, political dysfunction, unfortunately, in the United States. Uh, hopefully, we try to bring Democrats and Republicans and moderates together here and, and hear all different perspectives. Uh, Vinod asks, uh, is the internal U.S. political instability good or bad for China? Oh, it's good. Yeah. No, I think they think they they see it as uh, you know they looked at the 2008. Uh, 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 financial crisis as evidence that the U.S. Uh, financial and economic systems were were fundamentally less sound than than uh, China's, and they look at the 2000, uh, 2020, both our political uh, 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 complications and our inability and our continued inability to respond to COVID uh, as evidence that our political system is is fundamentally flawed. So yeah, they see it both domestically. Uh, you know, they can point to their own people and say, "Is this what you want, the United States?" And they can point to the rest of the world and, and say the same thing. Yeah. All right. Another interesting question from Dayton um, uh, asks: Do you believe that the effects of the one-child policy uh, will, will, uh, you know, affect economic growth in the next 20 years? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's it's now it's not the one China the one-child policy anymore. It's Obviously, it's now that, or not obviously, but some of your audience may not know that has been significantly relaxed. Now, most families mm -hmm. can have three children if they want to. But I, for, for a long time, I've been calling it the six adult policy, which is now one kid has to see to the welfare of six adults, their parents uh, and both sets of grandparents, you know, that, that uh, you know, the, what helped propel China's economic miracle in the 1980s and 1990s, which is a really strictly enforced one-child policy, uh, where you know a married couple could only have one kid, uh, and so you had lots of uh, workers, working-age people, and relatively few people uh, who depended on them. Not many children, and because China was just emerging from uh, an era when you didn't live very long, not that many old people. So you had lots and lots of workers and not much need for so you know who don't need much in terms of social safety support uh, and and uh, and not many old folks or, or uh, and not many older young folks who need it. Uh, now that's turning around and it's turning around very very hard and very very quickly. Uh, some of your audience may have seen that uh, earlier this year, I think it was March, the every ten year census was supposed to be released in China. That was delayed from March till April. I think it finally came out in May. And my take on why it took an extra two months is not because of COVID, uh, you know, the problems we had with our census of, of you know, uh, the challenges of collecting data, but because they were concerned that the original data showed that the population had shrunk over the last 10 years, that, that already China's population was declining. Uh, and so the final number showed a, a growth of about 20 million people, which in a country of 1.4 billion people is really just a blip. I think that was just the, the, the statisticians putting their thumb on the scale to show, to, to put off by a decade it's that the uh, population is dropping. Now, you know, it sounds like that's not a, a, an extreme thing. You know, a country of 1.4 billion people uh, uh, you know, shrinking a little bit. But again, uh, so much of China's growth has been driven by its demographics, by those really favorable demographic tailwinds. And, and those are turning quickly into headwinds and it's gonna really affect Chinese growth. It's gonna really affect how they can think about how do we spend our money. And, and just a, a follow up to that, you know, as you know, a few years ago, they relaxed the policy to allow two children and more recently three. 
Uh, you know, obviously they're now hoping people will have more children, but perhaps culturally it's become more common that people only want to have one child. Uh, do you think in the years to come, it sounds hard for probably a lot of Chinese to believe that actually large scale migration might actually be necessary. And if that did happen, what would be the effects upon China? So the first part of your question, yeah, I mean, culture is funny, right? That, uh, you know, for, for millennia, there was this uh, emphasis on having lots of children, particularly having lots of, of sons. That has, you know, uh, the one child policy, but more importantly, just the fact that, look, we all know uh, modern life, you know, if you're middle class, it's expensive to raise a kid and it's particularly expensive in, uh, in Chinese cities where real estate, because of a number of of uh, economic policies that the government has implemented is really expensive. Uh, education is really expensive. And so all of the, uh, the things you think about when you're talking about should we have one kid, uh, let alone should we have two kids or three kids, uh, push in the same direction, which is one kid is great. You know, that, that mom and dad say they wanna have a, a grandkid, we'll have one kid. Uh, and even a lot of people are saying, ah, we don't need one kid. You know, none is fine, and I'll take the heat from my mom. Uh, and and uh, uh, so, so I think absolutely, uh, you know, culture is hard to change. It has changed, and it's going to be hard to change back. Uh, yeah, the need for for uh, inbound immigration, uh, absolutely, you could see that happening. Uh, you know, and China is unlike a lot of places. It is not the the kind of multi ethnic culture that the United States is, but it has some tradition, and it's a tradition seen through Han eyes of multiculturalism, of having multi, uh, uh, different ethnic groups in the same uh, political structure. Uh, and so I think, you know, they will have to rethink their social contract, uh, but it's not un unimaginable that you would have that. I, I, the, the problem is, is where do you get the kind of numbers that it would take uh, to to address the the population shortfall uh, that, that that China faces, I don't think there's you know that that in the sort of uh, in Greater Asia there's really not that kind of uh, uh, there's not that engine of of uh, immigration out there. Um, uh, another uh, member asked, it's um, it's they didn't put their name, but I suppose related to we're talking about the incredible amount of, of Chinese investment all around the world. Um, what can the U.S. do to deter our large scale? Oh, sorry, no, sorry, that's wrong. Um, uh, are any countries regretting um, the Chinese lar largesse over the years, and maybe some of the terms? And and uh, you know, we think of, I'm thinking of say the the port of Sri Lanka that was reclaimed. Um, can you talk about maybe any of the countries maybe having second thoughts about entering these massive economic agreements with China? Sure, absolutely. I mean, look. Uh, a lot of the, the deals that were negotiated uh, were negotiated by, by political elites who didn't necessarily have just the interest of the country uh, in mind or uh, you know, didn't do the due diligence on you know, uh, how much it would take to uh, amortize the kind of investment that the Chinese are putting in. So there's a lot of regret out there. Uh, and I think people are, are uh, People, countries are, are much more cautious going in. Although you know the phenomenon of uh, corruption has not been licked, and so you still have those incentives, the short-term incentives of either for personal interest, uh, in other words, skimming a little off what comes in, uh, uh, the investment that comes in, or the political interest of, hey, you know, in 20 years this, or in 10 years, or in five years this will be a problem. But my elections next year, and you know that, uh, you know, getting uh, uh, Chinese investment in, even if the terms are lousy, uh, serves my short-term interest. You know that hasn't changed, and so I think that's uh, that's uh, going to continue to be a factor. But you know, there's a lot of of sellers remorse on, in China as well as they look at some of the investments they've made and realize that they're not going to get their money back. Uh, you know, the uh, most of those Chinese investments were. Uh, designed as, as you know, commercial investments. Uh, and uh, the reason that, that money hadn't been, you know, the US or the inter multilateral development banks or other sources hadn't put money into those projects is because they weren't economically viable. 
uh, and the fact that it was Chinese money doesn't make them any more economically viable. All right, uh, and maybe you just touch upon it quickly. We discussed it a bit earlier in the conversation, but uh, someone asks, um, what can the U.S. do to deter large-scale Chinese uh, cyber espionage uh, that affects U.S. business and government? I mean, oh, I know I, you're not I, an IT expert, so yeah. yeah I'm not. But. I, I am speaking to you from my tiny little laptop because I blew up my larger uh, computer earlier today. <laughs> so I feel uniquely unqualified to answer this question. But I will divide those into two, uh, two areas, you know, the, the government and business. Government has always been fair game, right? Governments spy on each other. Uh, and you remember back in the Obama administration, uh, uh, he reached what he thought was a deal that essentially was that, that you know, mm -hmm. don't, uh, I, we will not call you out if you go after our government uh, mm -hmm. uh, secrets, but don't use government resources for commercial purposes. In other words, don't uh, uh, commit commercial espionage against American companies. I think if you talk to the CIOs of most uh, multinational companies, they would say that that has not succeeded, uh, that uh, they continue to be, whether it's China or Russia or you know, lots of other places, and whether it's governments or, or uh, individuals and groups, uh, it's a real problem. And, and uh, you know, naming and shaming and, and uh, you know, some other uh, sort of offensive practices may work on the margins, but I think the main thing has got to be you know, if you're a company, if you're a business person, and you have uh, technology that makes you different and competitive, uh, and that would, un you know, you, your competitive position would be undermined if you were to lose it, understand that you're not the only person who knows that, that, you know, there are people out there who are going to try to steal it. Uh, and you have to, you know, that, uh, complaining about it afterwards may be satisfying, but will not get your intellectual property mm -hmm. back. The only thing you can do is you've got to, uh, you know, put the kinds of investment in protecting your intellectual property and protecting your systems uh, that you did in developing the property in the first place. And lastly, uh, just for the sake of time, um, when we conclude here, I'm going to just ask two questions that are very similar. And I think also maybe allow you a, a point to kind of give any kind of summation you'd like. Uh, Dennis asked, do you believe, as uh, I do, that there is an unreasonably antagonistic attitude in the U.S. towards China? Um, and then Tyler asks, you know, related to that, uh, would it take, uh, what would it take or what approach would be needed to, to improve U.S.-China relations, uh, which seem to be at an all-time low? Well, an unreasonably antagonistic, like, I, I think it's useful to take the emotion out of things. I am not surprised that China, look, China is a big country. It is, its uh, economic uh, uh, influence has grown. Its political aspirations have grown. I'm not surprised that it has, uh, 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 you know, that we are rubbing up against each other. I, I think antagonism and emotion is not particularly useful in these sorts of considerations. You know, our considerations should be, where are our interests? What do we have to do to defend our interests, to protect our interests? Uh, and then focus on that. And, you know, I talked about this earlier, Ronan, uh, the, the country over which we have the most influence is the United States. And so, you know, if we identify that there are concerns about China, yes, we should talk about them. Yes, we should flag them. Yes, we should call them out publicly if they need to be called out publicly. But for the most part, I think we should look at what do we, what can we do here in the United States? Uh, to address those concerns. You know, on that, I talked about Democrats and Republicans uh, cooperating. And look at this infrastructure legislation that just passed. I hope it, it, uh, uh, it gets through and the president's able to sign it. Because that's the kind of thing uh, that, you know, it is really shocking to come from China to the United States and see just how much better China's infrastructure is uh, uh, than, than what we have here in the United States in a lot of cases. And you know that's not just a point of pride. If you're doing business, uh, it makes a big difference if you can, you know, if you're making your stuff inland and, and you don't have to worry about am I going to be able to get it to markets? Am I going to be able to get it to port? Uh, and so those sorts of things have a real impact on on uh, our competitiveness uh, as a country. Things like education, you know, that, that it makes a difference if uh, 
if kids are getting good K through 12 and then the opportunity to, to go to university, uh, uh, hopefully uh, encouraged to go in STEM, but also in, in other areas that will make us more competitive uh, internationally. So, so uh, uh, you know, it, it's great to be concerned about what's going on in China, but I think the, the, the majority of our response should be where we have the, the greatest leverage, which is here at home. And I'm sorry, I missed your second question. Uh, it was related to that. I mean, basically, you know, what can be done to improve U.S.-China relations? And I mean, I think you've you've touched upon it. Yeah. Uh, one, like I, I think, I, to me, you have to accept that good relations are not the goal. The, you know, the good relations are a tool for achieving other goals. Uh, that that you know, we should strive for relations that are constructive, that allow us to manage our issues. Uh, but, but you know, if we have to have frictions at friction between us at times, that's okay if it's in pursuit of a goal that we both understand. Uh, you know, that China's getting what it needs in areas, and we're getting what we need. But you know, relations for relations' sake uh, are useful. It's nice, uh, but but you got to focus on on what, what what your target is. That's I mean, very good and kind of a bit of real politic. And I suppose, you know, that's always a, as a diplomat and ambassador, I, I like hearing, I like hearing it directly instead of saying our country loves your country and your country loves our country. So, so um, uh, again, to, to all the audience here in person, and everyone home, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, again, I'd remind you uh, on September 9th, we'll have a, a program related to obviously uh, the recent news um, uh, out of Afghanistan. Uh, it's called Al Qaeda and ISIS, the fall of Afghanistan and the terrorist threat to the United States. That will be with Mahida Afsal, uh, South Asia expert from the Brookings Institution, and with Stephen Tankle. He is a former senior defense advisor. He's now at the Center for New American Securities and also teaches at American University. And then on September 30th, we have related to some of what we're talking about here and all of Afghanistan. Hopefully the United States can uh, get a bit more forward thinking sometimes. Uh, a program called U.S. Grand Strategy, The Art of War in an Age of Peace, uh, with renowned uh, defense analyst and expert uh, Michael O'Hanlon, who we've hosted here before. And, uh, you know, his, every time I talk to him, he's uh, he calling me from Fort Benning or wherever he is, or, or at CENTCOM down in Florida. He's some of the a direct pulse with uh, some of the top military leaders in the Defense Department and also our, uh, our military. So we'd love to have you all join us for that. That program will be in person here at MG Bank, and also we will have it uh, virtually for those who still want to attend virtually. And again, thank you, Ambassador Rank, so much for joining us again. We're delighted to have you. Um, next time, we promise it'll be in person if, if COVID will let us let us go and let us get back to normalcy. And uh, thank you again so much for, for your years of service to the country. And a lot of times it's very difficult and uh, dangerous places, including uh, Afghanistan. So thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.